Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this month's issue of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine. With you is Danya Koja and Wendy Chang. And today we're going to be talking about the June 2019 issue of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine. If you don't know Critical Decisions, it is ASAP's official CME publication. In each issue, there are two lessons in which we discuss topics in emergency medicine that can either be bread and butter or cutting edge. There's the critical EKG, critical procedure, our newest feature. The critical cases in orthopedics and trauma. Yeah, and then there's my favorite, the LLSA review. Of course. And tox box, drug box, there's a ton of things. So stay tuned so we can talk about some of these topics, but definitely, if you have a moment, check out the actual publication. So for our first lesson, we're talking about current events, electrical and lightning injuries. Thank you to Drs. Jessica Walruth, Brian Wood, and David Delagustina for writing this article. So the article starts with like busting a very common myth, which is that both electrical and lightning injuries involve some electrical exposure and are similar, which is why they're always in the same chapter, right? But apparently they're not. What? Electricity isn't the same? No, apparently electricity that comes from the lightning is different than electricity that comes from humans. All right. There's a table, I see. Yes. So there's a table that's pretty great because it explains the difference between lightning injuries and then low and high voltage electrical injuries. And then there's volts and seconds and things that are kind of confusing. But otherwise, it's a pretty good summary of why things are different. How much electricity is a shock from like an electrical outlet? Because you know, those people with kids, they put little plastic things covering those up. I know, they make it really hard for me to use electrical outlets. (laughs) And are the plastic things a choke hazard? I mean, they're usually large, but yes. But then it choke hazard and not an electrical hazard. You gotta pick. You can fix one (laughs) than the other easily. (laughs) So it depends on what kind of electrical exposure. And that is the most important question that you gotta ask when someone comes in with an electrical injury is what were they exposed to? Are you talking about a house outlet? Are you talking about a power line? Or an AC current or a DC current. That sounds like a musical group. (laughs) (laughs) I think we should play some music. Don't you think we should be playing music one day? Yes. (laughs) So other questions that you got to ask your patient to try to figure out when they're coming in with an electrical injury is the duration that they were actually exposed to this. Because if you have tetany, you can actually like hold a cord like in the cartoons, right? And they're like, exactly. You guys cannot see Wendy, but she, she does a really good job showing that, um, where you have like the prolonged exposure. And then you can have trauma, so you can be like flung off and get injuries. And then if you had any arrhythmias pre-hospital. Of course, of course. ABCs and ACLS precedes all of this. So since they're at risk for arrhythmias, that means we get an EKG. Always! Everybody has to be naked. You got to undress your patients to make sure that you're looking at all of their injuries. And interestingly enough, after you're done with your EKG or while you're getting your EKG, you need to protect their necks. Oh. Like cervical spine precautions. Wow. Okay. Yep. And then now that they're undressed, you can calculate their burns. But you got to keep in mind that their deep tissue burns can occur with very minimal superficial burns. So aside from an EKG, what else do we do? Do we check labs too? So you can check labs. You can actually check a troponin if you want, but that really poorly correlates with cardiac damage and left ventricle dysfunction. Something you got to think about is rhabdo. So you want to get a CK level to see, especially if someone had tetany and had the prolonged exposure to the electrical outlet. So let's say whomever got shocked by an electrical source knows exactly how much electricity that was. Why? (laughs) Because I'm thinking most people don't know. And so how do we, like, risk stratify these people? Well, if they had tetany, then you need to be very concerned, okay? If they held on to that wire and they couldn't let it go, big problem. Another very concerning risk factor or feature is that if they have a transthoracic pathway for the burn, so if it goes from arm to arm, arm to leg, or for whichever reason they had this direct contact with the chest, then those are patients that are at a very high risk of arrhythmia and death. And then, of course, wet skin. Summertime, pool time. Yep. And toasters and bathtubs. Isn't that like... Not together, hopefully. (laughs) No, isn't that how horror movies... Wasn't there a horror movie? Hair dryers, not Hair dryers. (laughs) I keep my toaster in the bathroom, okay? (laughs) Because you don't know when you might want a piece of toast. 
<laughs> Maybe right after the shower. <laughs> so yes, hair dryer and bathtubs. All right. Other complications? So we talked about rhabdo, which is definitely important to think about. The other thing that we need to worry about is compartment syndrome. As we said before, you can have a lot of deep tissue damage without a lot of superficial burns. So if someone had electrical um, injury to one of their extremities, you definitely want to observe them. So when do we need to admit people for monitoring? So it depends on if they were low voltage or high voltage. If they're low voltage, then only if they had a loss of consciousness, they had a documented arrhythmia either while you're in the hospital or in the pre-hospital, or if they had an extensive injury and pain to their body. You may want to keep them in the ED for like six hours, keep them on a monitor and repeat an EKG. The data is unclear on that. But if they're high voltage, they need to stay. They are not going home. What about kids? They always get into trouble. Like we said, choke hazard with the little covers. Yes, but, but if they don't choke on it and they put their fingers in electrical outlet, then it's the same thing like adults. If there's loss of consciousness, arrhythmia, or extensive injuries and pain. However... There's the one big difference. If they decide to chew on a wire. There's that lip thing. Yes. It comes up on boards, right? Like the picture, it's mm-hmm. like a little kid. I think it's one picture that shows up on all the textbooks. Which, I don't know if that kid gets royalties. <laughs> I don't think so. So if they bite on the wire and they ended up with an electrical injury, they can have a delayed bleed from their labial artery. And the bleed can happen five days to two weeks afterwards. So definitely something to have very clear discharge instructions on because they bleed a lot. All right. So what about lightning? Is it any different? So I found that very fascinating. Um, Lightning injuries are extremely interesting because although the magnitude itself is really high, the rate is so fast that the amount of energy that's actually transferred to the body is relatively limited. So there's the cartoon again where the lightning zaps you on the head. Yep. So that is one of six mechanisms by which lightning can affect you. Who knew? The one where the lightning actually zaps you in the head is called a direct strike, and it's not common, but it is pretty dangerous. There's some other ones where it's like ground current, which is the most common way, where you're standing outside and your feet are apart. So the current travels through your legs, like from one leg through to the other one and goes back to the ground. You can also have contact exposure. So if you're touching something metal that is hit by lightning, then it would affect you. And that's how people inside houses can actually be affected by lightning. You can have a side splash where the lightning jumps on you. I I know. Um, You can have an upward streamer so it can actually go upwards through the body. And then finally, you can also have blunt trauma. Sort of like when we think of explosive injuries where you can have, like you can get blown off and be injured because of that shock. Got it. All right. So how do we take care of these patients in the scene? So scene safety is extremely important, of course, just like any time we take care of anyone in the scene. Keep in mind that most people are going to die within one hour from a systole or cardiac arrest, secondary to respiratory center paralysis, if they were to die. And then, of course, it's super important to take their clothes off as well to prevent thermal injury to their skin. So just like electrical um, injuries, we get EKGs and screening labs? Well, EKGs definitely, but... Remember how we said that the contact time is so short that they actually don't get that much damage? They're a lot less likely to get rhabdo, interestingly enough. Hmm. All right. So you might do better if you got struck by (laughs) (laughs) Yes. As long as it does not hit you on the head. That's right. Okay. Are there any specific injuries that we have to worry about? So just like we said with the direct strike, you could be hit directly in the head and If the patient had alternatal status or that head entry, then you definitely need to CT their head. Like with electrical injuries, you got to have spine precautions as well because you can cause cervical spine injuries. They can perforate their trypanic membrane and they can have sensorineural hearing loss. So they definitely need ENT follow-up. They can have delayed cataracts like years later, so they need off the follow-up. And a very interesting thing is that they can have temporary medriasis, so they can actually have fixed dilated pupils because of the electrical shock. So be careful not to call that a reliable indicator of death because someone was electrocuted. So now we need to add to our adage of they're not dead until they're warm and make Mm. sure they were not struck by lightning. That is absolutely true. You're only dead if you're unstruck by lightning. Correct. Well, what do we do in the case of somebody severely injured and comes in in cardiac arrest? 
So what is also very interesting about lining injuries is that we always talk about this and I can vent about this for a while, right? But we talk about the fact that how most adults have cardiac arrest and the pulmonary component is secondary to that. With kiddos, it's usually pulmonary and then cardiac is secondary to that, right? But with lining injuries, it's usually cardiopulmonary as in two separate things because the cardiac component, they may have ROSC, but if they have a paralysis of their medullary respiratory center, then they're still going to continue to be in respiratory arrest. So that needs to be addressed as if it's two separate things rather than one. Wow. All right. So of course, there must be neurological injuries. Of course. You found something to talk about, Wendy. (laughs) So there is some transient effects and some permanent effects. Some things are immediate, like seizures, amnesia, headache, paresthesias. But there's also something pretty interesting called chiranoparalysis. Have you heard of it before? No. Well, I, there's the paralysis part I could figure out. Mm-hmm. But apparently what happens is that patients have temporary lower motor paralysis. It may also affect their upper extremities as well. And they would have cyanosis, pallor, paresthesia, and pulselessness. And the reason this happens is that they have autonomic vasospasms that cause these symptoms. Patients can also have permanent effects from lightning, whether they have like a hypoxic brain injury or a bleed or an infarct, that would affect them, of course. The coolest part from this article is the picture of the skin ferning. Yep. It's pathognomonic, but interestingly, it is not permanent. And it looks just like a fern. So Harry Potter's lightning strike scar is fake. Yes. Don't tell the kids. Okay. <laughs> Now, patients can also have actual burns that are permanent, and they can be linear, they can be punctate, they can be thermal because their clothes stayed on them. What about the worst case scenario, a pregnant patient? So if a pregnant person gets exposed to lightning, then that's actually a really low risk to mom because the amniotic fluid is very conductive of electricity. So it actually all goes to the amniotic fluid, but then you have a very high risk to the baby with 50% mortality. Okay. I'm assuming these people all need to be admitted because it sounds very scary. So if it's a direct strike, yep. If they get hit in the head, they have cranial burns and so on, they absolutely need to get admitted. If their EKG is abnormal, they must get admitted. But otherwise, not really. Like, hey, you got struck by lightning, go home. All right. So I learned that electrical injuries from household stuff or whatnot is very different from lightning injuries, mostly because of the direct amount of electrical activity as well as the duration of the contact. So a lot of it has to do with the mechanism as well as um, how this electrical impulse travel through the body. We have to be worried if people had tetany, if they had a pathway that goes through the heart. Um, we also have to worry, of course, if they had neurological symptoms like loss of consciousness, etc. We do have to get an EKG and labs like CK, screen for rhabdo, uh, but there are a lot of injuries we have to be worried about. Spinal precautions, tympanic membranes, cardiopulmonary death. Still very scary stuff, but I think this article gave me a lot more information to go with. That was a great summary, Wendy. Thank you for listening to me sometimes. <laughs> and actually, this is a great segue to our next part of this issue, which is what we are talking about earlier, the critical cases in orthopedics and trauma. And interestingly, this is a case of someone who comes in with compartment syndrome after an electrical injury and needs emergent fasciotomy. So if your person comes in with compartment syndrome, then it's very important that you perform the fasciotomy emergently in order to decrease the intracompartmental pressure. And the article is great. It has quite a few pictures that show you what these lines are to go along his compartment, Um, specifically the upper extremity, because I don't know if that's been your experience as well, Wendy, but people tend to talk a lot about lower extremity fasciotomies because it's so much easier to explain. But this is definitely an important one. Absolutely. Way too many compartments to keep track of. That's why we have diagrams. And Google. Yes. Yep. All right. So for the LLSE review this month, we actually have an article on mesenteric ischemia, which is a great review of that there are different types of mesenteric ischemia, whether it's arterial, venous, or non-occlusive, or even chronic, and that lactates are not 100% sensitive in all the cases. Of course, uh, you have to have a high index of suspicion, consider getting a CTA in this patient and treating it urgently with whether surgery, definitely a lot of resuscitation. So definitely check it out. Sounds good.
The critical procedure for this month is uterine packing for postpartum hemorrhage. So this is basically a triple whammy, right? You have a patient who comes to the emergency department, you deliver the baby, and then you resuscitate the baby, and then now the baby is fine, but the patient is bleeding. Yep, exactly. So in this case, you should start with a bimanual uterine massage, and there's a great picture of that on how to do it, and maybe consider using pharmacological agents like oxytocin, ergots, prostaglandins, and then really it comes down to trying to tamponade or pack the source of the bleeding. And so you can use pre-made devices, Foley catheters, maybe even a Blakemore. Uh, but specifically on packing, you want to use something like Curlex so that you can do a back and forth layer. I would be doing a back and forth running to the phone, calling people to come downstairs and take my patient. I agree. Yes. But that was pretty interesting about the Blakemore though. Yeah. Hopefully I would never, ever, ever have to do that, but that's interesting. Agreed. All right, so for our second article in this month's issue, it's called Indirect Pressure, Non-Compressible Traumatic Hemorrhage. Thank you to Dr. Holly Ringhauser and Peter Thomas for writing this article. So kind of continue our discussion of bleeding, and in this case, hemorrhagic shock. Of course, we want to apply direct pressure if it's in the case of postpartum bleeding, direct pressure with yep. uh, packing. Uh, but there are cases, of course, where we are not able to apply direct pressure, and this article looks at the options. So what exactly are we supposed to do if you cannot put your hand on the thing that's bleeding? Well, you're going to try and reduce the blood flow to the area that's bleeding. So these are your life-saving procedures, resuscitated thoracotomy, pelvic binders, or Rebola. Well, all of these sound like really cool interventions. And I think I can figure out pelvic binders on my own. But thoracotomies? When do we really have to do that by ourselves in the emergency department? Well, you know, we of course say that really these should be considered for patients with penetrating trauma and a CPR that's been ongoing for less than 15 minutes as uh, how Western Trauma Association defines it. But that's the most accepted indication, although you can potentially consider it in blunt trauma or other conditions, but obviously that's less accepted. There's a nice table that describes the indications for resuscitative thoracotomy in the article as well as a great algorithm. All right, so let's say someone comes in with like an absolute indication for that, which is a penetrating chest trauma with signs of life initially, but then has a cardiac arrest right at the door of the emergency department. What do we do? Well, we're not going to go through the nitty gritty of the procedure, but essentially we're trying to open up the chest so that we can explore for where the heart may have been damaged, as well as to reduce the source of the hemorrhage by doing a cross clamp of the aorta, and that way they can maintain perfusion of the heart as well as the brain. You would perform internal cardiac massage, and then you can also explore and examine the hilum for bronchopulmonary injuries. You make it sound so simple, Wendy. Yeah, I just crack open the chest, look for these things. Eh, just as easy as a pelvic binder. When do we use those? <laughs> so to classically in open book fractures, because we worry about injury to the pelvic plexus, or even iliac arteries, etc. And so you can use commercial binders or bed sheets. The key is to really apply them across the greater trochanter, not too high, because too high you would compress the abdomen, too low wouldn't apply any pressure across the pelvis. Another tip is that if you were to use bed sheets, you don't want to actually tie them because the knot wouldn't provide adequate really pressure, and so you should use towel clamps. I've seen EMS bring patients from the field with like pelvic binders and then they have to wrap the feet. Is that a thing or yeah. is that made up? Yeah, because internally rotating the legs will also help the pelvis, you know, stay together. Okay. All right. So now... Raboa. Woo. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> what is Raboa? So it stands for resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. And the idea is that you're trying to... I like to... Raboa more. I know, exactly. It's too long. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that you want to inflate a balloon in different areas of the aorta. So that way you can reduce the amount of bleeding to whether it's an intra-abdominal source or a pelvic source. 
while your surgeons help you in giving you definitive treatment. So you put in an arterial catheter in the femoral artery and blow up a balloon. Yep, exactly. The key is that you have to know which zone of the aorta that you're blowing up the balloon. So there's a great picture. The bad one that's bleeding. Yes, (laughs) correct. The idea is that if you think about the aorta in three zones, from the left subclavian down to the celiac artery is zone one, the celiac to the renal is zone two, and the renal down to the iliac is zone three. If you have an intra-abdominal source of bleeding, like just a positive fast, then you would want to blow up the balloon above the area of the bleeding, so in zone one. Whereas if you have a pelvic area bleeding, you want to blow up the balloon in zone three, uh, just directly above where you think your pelvic vessels might be coming from. And you never want to blow up the balloon in zone two because that is just causing direct ischemia to your mesenteric organs. Got it. Any contraindications or can everyone get Reboa? I wish. It sounds like it's like the thing, right? But certainly if you're worried about uh, thoracic sources, it doesn't help anything with that. Uh, And aortic injuries, if people obviously have had prior vascular manipulations of their aorta, probably a bad idea. Awesome. Anything else that we got to think of with these patients that you just talked about that are coming in with bleeding that's non-compressible? Yeah, especially probably with some of our colleagues who may not have these fancy toys, right, at their shop, but we should always keep it in mind our everyone bed- has bed sheets that's right everyone has bed sheets uh, but what we do best as emergency physicians is resuscitation right so keeping in mind to keep them warm uh, use massive transfusion txa if you have it uh, damage control resuscitation really right you're trying to avoid that lethal triad all right so we talked about how some patients are going to come in with hemorrhagic shock and their bleeding is not easily compressible on the outside so we got to think inside the box. So resuscitative thoracotomy for people who are coming in with penetrating chest trauma with signs of life initially that go into cardiac arrest, obviously you can consider in other people. If you use a pelvic binder for someone who has an open pelvic fracture, make sure to put it at the level of the greater trochanters and wrap it well, whether it's a bed sheet or a binder, and make sure to wrap their feet as well. And think of verboa in people who are having either intra-abdominal bleeding or pelvic bleeding, and it's simply... Femoral arterial catheter, you snake the balloon through and inflate it in the correct zone. If they're bleeding all the way in their belly, then it needs to go high up in zone one. If they're bleeding their pelvis, it can be all down in zone three. That's it. Exactly. All right. So for the critical EKG this month, it's a great reminder for us to compare and look at the amount of ST elevation in AVR and AVL, especially if the ST elevation is greater than the ST elevation in V1, because both of these can be very specific for a left main occlusion. So respect the AVR. Exactly. So our critical image this month is an interesting case of someone who presents with chest pain the day after they have a visual field loss that was transient. And The images are really cool. It's very interesting. And it's a very important reminder of considering PE with left to right shunt causing systemic infarcts and someone coming in with risk factors for DVTs and PEs, but instead with systemic clots. Check out the CTA because this is definitely more than just a PE. Very cool. Our drug box this month talks about intranasal ketamine, which is coming to a shop near you. Not an ED, really, because it's being used for outpatient management of depression, and there's a very strict protocol about it because there's high risk of abuse. And then last but not least, our tax box. And for this month, we are ending with an oldie but goodie, ethylene glycol poisoning, which is antifreeze or radiator fluid. If you have never ever seen any of that, you have never been to ABEM General, you have never taken an in-service exam or a board exam, because for some reason, everyone drinks that ABEM General. So these patients come in with an iron gap metabolic acidosis and they have crystals in their urine. Treatment? Give them alcohol. If you don't have alcohol at your shop and you have a lot more expensive things, then technically you can give them femepazole. But hey, you can give them alcohol too. You may be able to dialyze them if they have a lot of acidosis that's refractory, acute kidney injury, altered mental status, or if their levels are higher than 20. 
Awesome. Great reminder for especially our maybe graduating residents who will be visiting Ava in general soon. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to us this month. We hope you enjoyed listening to us as much as we've enjoyed recording this. With you was Donnie Koja. And Wendy Chang. And you can connect with us on Twitter via our Twitter handles. My Twitter handle is at Dania Koja. Mine is at EM underscore NCC. Last month, we posted some interesting images and tidbits from the Critical Decisions issue. And so we'll try and do that again this month just to get your thoughts on how you would approach some of these cases. And until next month, bye.